The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You guys have got to realize who you are. You've got to realize that. Most people have their identity. It's bound within what man said it was. God said you're something different. you got to determine within yourselves who you're going to believe. Mankind or your father. Your father says you're in this world, not of this world. That's what he says, right? A lot of people shy away from spiritual things. Probably not the best idea, but at some point, everybody has to deal with it on a specific level. So the first thing you have to recognize is that you are not what the world said you are. They do their best to tell you what you are. But I've found they tell you basic things, but they try to make you hold on to things that will fight against your faith. For example, in the Bible it says, as a man thinketh, so is he. I'm going to give you a clue to something. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. The Lord said that if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could go tell a mountain to go throw itself in the ocean or the sea, and it would. Why would that happen? You ready for the answer? A real answer. From time to time in your lives, you've talked to someone. Suppose they were looking for something, and you helped them out, but you had no idea you'd never been in their house or something like that. And all of a sudden, you get this snapshot of what their house is like, or you get an idea of where it could be. And amazingly enough, it's right where you said it was. Let's say you're talking to somebody else, and they have a problem, and you tell them something to tell somebody else or to say to ease the tensions or something, and they do, and it works. Where do you think that comes from? When you attempt to help anybody, and you can forget what the world has named you to be, something else starts happening with you. When you focus on another person, doesn't matter who you are, when you focus on somebody else, you're going to find that there's a broader mind at work. You're going to find that something else is at work within you, and it always has been. You're also going to find that you've been fighting something, resisting something. Whoever can tell you who you are, that's who you become. Whatever you believe, that's what you become. Some of you are sick. For an example, you're sick, something is wrong, and you actually believe what they told you. And so you dwell on that, and your problem can stagnate. I'll tell you something. If you don't dwell on that, somebody tells you you're sick, you kick fear out, or let's just say you just come to terms, and you say, oh, well, what will be will be, but let me serve the Lord. What happens is you're not focused upon your sickness, and so you end up not confirming your sickness. You end up having a desire for that sickness to be out of the way so you can finish on with God's work. You know what happens? Your sickness is going to change because you're not claiming it anymore. Because you're not dwelling on it anymore. You're actually doing something biological that you've always been able to do. You can begin to command your body to do specific things. You don't have to know how. You just have to have a desire. So when you have a strong desire for something, you begin to walk toward that desire. And you're try not trying to figure out the intricacies of how things work. You actually start giving commands to everything around you to conform to that desire. And guess what happens? It ends up just like you desired. It does. For example, when I get sick, right? I can't, I can't get sick. I can't. I've been broken, busted, and everything else. And I cannot get sick because it will slow me down. And I still have to contend with things. But it's all in my mindset. Right? And, and people get messed up around me. In other words, observing. Because they, they'll say, you're not supposed to be able to do what you do. But too bad for that. I don't have time for sickness. And so my mind is always on working for somebody else. Now, there is key. There is key. I never concentrate on doing something for me. I'm not driven by it. There's not enough motivation I can drudge up with that, right? But I'm always focused on working for somebody else. You know what happens when you focus on doing things for somebody else? First of all, you're not focused on yourself anymore. You're focused on somebody else. It becomes a motivation that outweighs everything else of yourself. So you don't give in to anything. See, when you run into an obstacle and you're doing something for yourself, you start thinking, am I worth it? No. Do I deserve it? No. This, that, and the other. But out of love for somebody else, when you labor for somebody else, and when you run into an obstacle or a brick wall and a voice whispers, are they worth it? You'll say, yes, they are. Are they worth every effort you're putting into this? Yes, they are. Because you're looking for nothing out of it. And you end up doing things. That's just absolutely impossible. I mean, impossible. That's what happens. When love is your motive for somebody external of yourself, you never run out of steam in going forward. Every single person out there who has an issue with spiritual activity in their homes, you ran out of motivation for yourself. You can't deliver yourself. 
You can't do it. You're possibly your mind may be set and getting normal again so you can go and enjoy a walk or something like that. I can tell you right now that's not going to last too long. But by love, when you put your focus towards somebody else or something else concerning somebody else, now you're doing something. Now you're doing something that nothing can stop because now you're doing something bound in love, which is actually connected to who you actually are, which is why you can risk so much doing something for somebody else. And as long as you can push those voices out of your mind, that will come up with all sorts of things like, yeah, you're doing this for nothing. So what? I'm still doing it because you're doing it for somebody else. The Lord said, do all things as you would do unto the Lord, right? He never qualified who you're doing it for. When you do things out of love, things are, you know, these external powers that people don't understand are connected to it. And we're not talking about Satan's powers. No, we're talking about God's blessings. He has principles. And he taught us how to operate by those principles. The problem with us is we're trying to be experts on everything so we can publish something. Dare not to be the expert, but work in love without explaining anything. Just do it. And you'll be shocked who your life ends up being. You'll be shocked when people start falling around you, but you're still going. You'll be shocked when your health turns around, when your situation turns around. You'll be shocked because you're doing something in love. It has nothing to do with perfection. It has nothing to do with, with uh, all your focused efforts. In anything holy, it has everything to do with you. Genuinely working in love for the sake of somebody else, that becomes a solid motivation. And when you do everything as you would do unto the Lord, now you're on the something. Now every force you can imagine will try to stop you. But because you're doing it for somebody else, tell them to go take a hike and keep working. That changes everything in your life because you step into your own destiny. If your children are the most high, you believe in Christ. You are purposed and meant to operate within love and forgiveness and holiness. It's not something you have to force yourself to do. It's something you choose to do. And so this brings up something else. Many of you have to choose how you're doing everything. Look at your life. Look at how much you're doing for yourself versus how much you're doing for somebody else where you do not benefit. If what you're doing for yourself weighs more than what you're doing for somebody else, you're going to be stagnant because you're not meant you're not meant to be like those in the world. And the only way you can become an overcomer is to step into who you really are. And who you really are, you're already acquainted with to a degree. It's just that many of us have listened to the world and try to emulate things in the world. Right? We have. We've tried to become like people in the world. And we can't become like people in the world. Because we are unique, a peculiar people. Correct? So you can't compare yourself to anybody in the world. Nobody can compare anybody in the world to you. You're one of a kind. Know that. Begin to operate in that. We also do something else that hinders us spiritually. You ready? The world works by a labor and reward system. Or I should say servitude and reward system. If you're not careful, you're going to bring that to your Christian walk. You're going to be looking for some type of reward for everything you do. And if you don't get that reward, which could be a thank you, which could be, you know, something in return, you're going to get tight. You're going to get sad, discouraged, simply because nobody would acknowledge the good that you're doing. Learn to do good and expect no one to acknowledge it. Because when you do that, your father will reward you openly. That's what many of you need. That's what you're missing. See how different the ways of the Lord are compared to the world? Do your labors authentically. Nobody will ever know. Now, they'll always look at you and say, well, you're not doing anything for anybody. That's what they do. Just remember something. The story of good people is always known after they pass. You know that? It's, not, it's hardly ever acknowledged in their lifetime. Because people judge by what they see. And if you're doing an authentic work, nobody can see it. So if nobody can see it, they'll never attribute that work to you. But after you pass, that's when people start talking. Well, they did so-and-so for me. Really? Oh, yes. And they did so-and-so for me. Really? Oh, yes. You find out after they pass. So learn to do things without people finding out and pat you on the back. Learn to do things authentically with absolutely no reward from people. Learn to do that. If you do that, you enrich your life big time. You'll enrich it to the point where things that kind of get you down now will never be able to affect you. They won't be able to affect you. They won't bother you. They won't move you. That's just like if a person came up to you, right? You know you're a good person at heart. Say, let's say this. Say you helped someone put a tire on a car. And the person you helped was very feeble. And nobody saw it, but you helped them put that tire on the car. And two weeks passed. You're in a conversation with, with a group, and that group says, You know what? You never helped anybody in your life. 
unless you benefit it. Now, you already know you helped that guy with the car. Never use that as a weapon and say, yes, I did. I went out there and helped so-and-so in a car. Don't do that. You know what you do? I'm going to tell you what you'll do. Because you did actually do something, you're not going to be offended. You're not going to be moved. People are going to say one of those derogatory remarks against you. You're just going to look at them. That's all. You can still smile. Why? Because you know what you've done. People often frown when people question their activities because it's a possibility it may not be in the heart or mindset that we want it to be in. If, say, say, for example, we help somebody out of a store, and that's all we do. And somebody says, well, you never helped anybody, and if you did, you probably did it so you could, uh, you know, hurry up and, and, and uh, get home or something. If they can make you think about your own servitude, you're going to start, you know, going down, down, down. Where do you go? But if you do it authentically, helping someone just for them, not so you can get to your own car quick enough, but you help them out of love because they need help. When that comment comes up, you know what spirit you were in when you did that. And guess what happens? You're not offended. You know when the Lord said offenses must come into the world? Remember that? It also tries us. There was there, there are some, several parts in the Old Testament about that. But it tries us as to who we are for us. God knows what we are. He doesn't need to know what you are. We need to know what we are, right? So that it can be bought out of us so that we will no longer deny it. We need to know who we are. That's part of your walk, to be in your identity, not for the sake of people. And all of us have to be careful of that. All of us do. All of us have to be careful of that because often you'll find that every work you do is challenged by somebody else. So stay in good spirits with that. Now, what happens as a consequence of this? Your father becomes your shield. That's what happens. Your father does. See, when a person is walking in love, they're also walking in the kingdom. Can Satan ever step foot in God's kingdom? No. When you walk in love like that, there's a reason why in the Bible it says love covers a multitude of sin. And many of you are trying to fight a fight. It's not your fight. It's going to make sense. And all of this is about your identity, who you are. So ask yourself, is who you are part of your appeasement of mankind? Are you trying to conform to some standard so that somebody else can accept you for something? Or are you who you are out of genuine reasons? Because you, you now recognize that surely you're part of the kingdom because you believe in Christ. Maybe not all because of works, but because you believe in Christ. Because if that be so, then begin to identify with it and don't speak against it. You know how people come up and say, well, I'm just, I'm just no one and this, that, and the other. Yes, you are someone to your father. You don't have to say you're special or anything else, but you most certainly are someone. Understand that your identity is based in Christ and that the world cannot see you for who you are. So if they can't see you for who, they are, for who you are, why would you ever be down when somebody says, you know, you're no one? All those deal with your identity and all too often in any type of spiritual issue. A person does not have an identity. They're trying to get an identity. They're trying to somehow forge an identity. They are trying to matter. And they believe negative things about themselves because they believe what others have said all around them for many years. So instead of listening to everybody around you, or should you do something, what everybody else says is still important. It is, but not for the reasons you think. Say, for example, they say, Mike, uh, you're too slow. Then I'll say, okay, let me, let, me, let me stop working in this redundant area so much and reapply myself to something over here and get some things done, right? That's helpful. That's not hurtful. If somebody says I'm too slow, it's not hurtful. It's helpful because they're telling me exactly how they feel about me. In fact, if you listen to a person's comments, even in the crazy rhetoric that they may have, they'll always help you. Everything Satan means to harm you can be used for your ultimate victory. Remember that. Now, your identity is bound in Christ. So you got to do something very important. You're going to have to go back, way back, and start seeing Christ in your life. Not the devil, Christ. You already know what you did wrong. No one need to tell you about that. That's not the point. It's what you've been delivered from. How many of you have been delivered from death itself? How many of you know you shouldn't be here right now? By all rights, you shouldn't be here by now, right? You know that little saying the world has, oh, we deserve better. I never said that. I know I deserve death. And because I know I deserve death, I have no complaints about the past. But I am extremely thankful for how God delivered me out of so much. 
Do you know how many times we have inflicted wounds upon ourselves? Let's go ahead and face that truth. Right? Most of the trouble we've had in our lives, we did it. We did that. We did. We chose something wrong against our better nature. We did not listen to the thousands of trumpets that were blowing saying, don't go in that direction. We get in these issues and circumstances and problems and we're still delivered. What love is that? It's some powerful love and we deserve death. But instead, we have life. Not only do we have life, but we have a belief in Christ. Isn't that awesome? Your belief in Christ is everything. Satan knows it. That's why he tries to diminish that. He tries to make you think it's so much more than that. No, because to believe in Christ is to believe what he said. That's just like if somebody said, hey, do you guys believe in Mike? But you never heard me. You can't answer that question, can you? But if you ever heard me before, you can say yay or nay. You can't say yay or nay unless you know what I stand for and what I'm saying. Well, you heard the gospel. To believe in Christ is to believe what he said. And what did he say? What did he keep saying? Over and over and over and over again. If you could sum up the gospel of Jesus Christ, what is it? You ever ask yourself that question? If you could sum it up, what is it? I've never heard that before. Maybe you guys have. I've never heard that before. I've heard it uh, directly to me in prayer and it stopped me one time. And I had no answer. I, I didn't. I stumbled and muffled all over that one. Can you believe that? I was in prayer. And a thought comes to me, and it wasn't mine, and said, if you could, you know, what is the gospel in, in total? And it was almost like it was asking me to say it in very few words. You know what I did? A, 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 a brain lock. That's what I had. And it forced me to rethink what the gospel was. That's what it did. See, when you have no answer, you're caught red-handed. Hand in the cookie jar, there you go. You're caught. You know the answer I ultimately gave? To sum up the gospel is to accept the sacrifice of the Lamb. The Lamb died because humanity lost its position. We were raised in darkness, and by the blood of the Lamb, we can put, be put back in our perspective positions. We are not living in a fallen state. We are living in a corrected state. It is to love your neighbor as yourself. Love is an action word. And to love the Lord God with all of what we are. Now that implies this. So here we go with this word. Uh, you know, love something again. Well, guess what? Guess what? How many of you love coffee? You're walking around the house, right? You're walking around your job. You say, wow, I need some coffee. That will really brighten my day. I just love the taste of it, right? That's only one aspect. You can't get enough of it, right? Not in a lustful way, but 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 you really appreciate it. Right? When you really love it, you appreciate the work that others put into it. You you appreciate the idea behind it. Because you start learning all about it. You just don't like something. You know the story of something. And you appreciate that something. To love your neighbor as yourself. I heard a person say, well, I don't love myself. I said, well, okay, why are you alive? And they couldn't lie to me. Because I knew what they had done. They couldn't lie because I've seen them save their own lives multiple times. That they would move out of enemy fire. That they would do things so they wouldn't get hurt. So they certainly love themselves. So what is to love a person? To love is to uphold. To love is to care about compassionately. To love is to regard. It's not one of them. It's all of them. When we love the Lord, we regard the Lord. We uphold the Lord. We believe the Lord. We acknowledge the Lord. We desire the Lord. We desire his word. We uphold his word. See how that works? You can't love anything you don't know about. That would be foolish. How many times have you thought you loved someone, but you did not know them? Had you known them, you wouldn't have hated you. You wouldn't have uh, you know hated them, but you surely would not have upheld them. There are people I know right now. I love them like a brother. Can I completely love them like the Lord God? No, I cannot, because I cannot uphold their deeds. But I can also separate the deeds from them. The deeds of a person. What happens to those sins? Christ did this. What happens to the deeds of a person? If God is a just God, then every deed we have performed, somebody's going to have to atone for that. What happens? I'll tell you. It's going to die with your flesh. Your sin will die with your flesh and all that's because of the blood of the Lamb. See, when Jesus comes back, should you belong to him, you're going to be changed. Your flesh is gone, period. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You can't. So your sin will die with your flesh. That means while you're here on this earth, the idea of who you were, you're separating from. You certainly are a new creature in Christ, going forward a different way. Though your sin may be attached 
to your identity because of your deeds, it will all die with the flesh. Jesus did that. That's why he died and was raised again. Raised incorruptible. Isn't that awesome? In cannot be corrupted. When he was raised, right, he could not be corrupted. No corruption of flesh. That means no more scars, bruises, all this kind of stuff. No more nothing. No more corruption. You are the same way. When you are raised from the dead, it is that the blood covered you. That's why in the Bible it says you have died with Christ. Yes, you sure have. Because he took on to himself all the deeds of your flesh that you ungodly committed. And all your harsh sayings. By way of that sacrifice, atonement was made. The price was paid, which leaves you, the born-again spirit, free. You're free from what you did, and Jesus did that for you. How beautiful is Christ to those who believe in him. How beautiful is Christ. That means when you beat yourself up, you're depressed, and all this, that, and the other, you have to be reminded, by way of Christ, you're separated from what you're guilty of. That's the good news. So you can't accept Christ and his sacrifice unless you're willing to repent. Unless you're willing to repent, you cannot accept the sacrifice. How beautiful is the news? How beautiful is that? Do you know how many people don't really know that? Like that? They really don't know. So they walk around not knowing, thinking about this potential. Well, what if I'm doomed? Well, what if this? What if that? No, nope. he paid the price for all time. From the beginning of your life to the very end. You're striving to do good, right? What happens if all of a sudden you commit some ungodly deed again? His grace is sufficient. Now, who would not get a little excited about that? Do you know how many people are grumpy because of their own deeds? Because they feel like they're doomed? Because they can't even believe the Bible that is totally real because of what they have done? They don't know the whole good news yet, do they? That's a pretty easy message, isn't it? That's the sum of it, sum total of the gospel. And now you being a brand new creature in Christ, you're not bound as you were before. You really are not. You're not bound. You think you are, but you're not. You're nothing like you were before. You can perceive no difference in a mirror, but I'm telling you, you are nothing like you were before. You're separated from your sin. You know what that means? If you're separated from your sin, the Lord has already told you how you're blessed because through the blood of the lamb you're also what the keeper of the commandments is a blessing for all those who keep the commandments of god you keep the commandments through christ because he took onto himself everything you ever broke that new creature is everything and do you know how many people are trying to go out there and be holy all by themselves without the blood of the lamb the bible addresses that too all those who do that are guilty again under the law. You're only free through Christ. They cannot keep nor honor the Ten Commandments like that. It's impossible. It's already broken. Even if they were to be free of it, the sins of their parents, parents, parents would be on them. The nature of flesh would be on them. Christ satisfied. He paid the price in full. Isn't that awesome? So now you're deemed the righteousness of Christ. That's who you really are. And when you say, when you say to yourselves, you're not worth it, be careful. Because you're, what you're really saying is that the blood is not powerful enough to cover all of what I did. And in that case, you speak like a liar, like Satan himself. What God did for us, no one can undo. Now that you know that, you have to find out about your new identity. And the world has no guidance for that. And that's a problem. We're so deeply embedded into the knowledge of the world, trying to find guidance for a born-again creature in Christ. It's not working out so well. Emulation of those in the world doesn't work. It does not work. You see that? Back to your identity. All too often, spiritual issues begin with a person when they have no identity. Because they have no identity, of course they're going to try and step in these other spirits. Depression. All these anger, all these things go with it. They're going to try and step in and have you form an identity that you will claim every day of your life so long as they can influence you. The only one that can tell you who you are is your Lord and Savior. No other voice, not even a human voice, only your Lord and Savior. All another brother and sister can say is you are the redeemed of the Lord. You're the redeemed. You're the ones that were lost, but you're found. You're being kept. Isn't it wonderful to know 
that Christ is the one seeing you through and you're not the one seeing you through. Now it's time to live like that. Now it's time to under, really understand that and begin to live like that. To live just like that. To remind yourselves about that. Some of you need to write something on your walls and say the world can, nobody can define me except Christ. And he accepts me. Remind everything about that and watch what happens. See, once you take yourself out of the cesspool of this world, full of blame and doubt and what-if scenarios, and you start walking in the truth, guess what the results are going to be? The truth. Whatever you walk in and whatever you live by, you will die by. You know, somebody wrote in there a little while ago, they say you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Well, guess what? If you live by the standards of this world, you're going to die by the standards of this world. Now, we know Christ died. So wouldn't you want to walk in holiness? With Christ giving you your identity to walk in that? Knowing that his death is the resurrection. Essentially, in him there is no death. Or would you rather walk by the identity of the world which keeps you depressed, keeps you in darkness, keeps you in shame, keeps you tired and worn out and all this, that, and the other, keeps you going back and forth, makes you feel like you don't have enough energy sometimes to make it throughout the day, that keeps you doing things you know you shouldn't do, and your life is like a yo-yo or a merry-go-round. You don't have to escape it. You simply have to step out of it. That is to say, stop accepting the world's identity of you. Accept the identity the Lord gave you. I don't know about you, but I, I don't have time to listen to negative spirits. Neither of the mind nor through anybody else's mouth. The Lord said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's only one way to resist the devil. Somebody look up that word devil and tell me what it means so people can understand that. Because that word resist is a very simple word. But we are to resist the devil and he will flee from you. But that word devil means something. Can somebody tell me what that means? See, that, that word devil and Satan mean two different things. You guys know that. And they are used in a specific context for a reason. So somebody tell me what devil means. Do you know Jesus used that word devils? Plural. Ah, somebody wrote it. Accuser. Resist the accuser. How do you resist an accuser? By believing Christ, not everybody else. See, when you believe what somebody is calling you, you'll become what somebody is calling you. You resist that through truth, through what Jesus said, not through what everybody else said. Hmm? Now, if you do that, my, my, something else takes place. So there we are. And that, notice that in the Bible, though, that word devil is used in a very specific context. Devil and devils, plural. Satan and Satan's, plural. It means something every time you read it, every time you see that word devil. It's going to be used in a specific context context. See, because you have the word Beelzebub. You have the word dragon. You do. You have those words there. Then you have devils. Then you have Satan's. And say, then you have a, something said the devil and Satan. When Satan was cast out of heaven, in the identification of him, it said the devil and Satan. Satan is a title of what darkness or evil is doing. Devil is a title of what darkness or evil is doing. The Lord gave us specific instructions, very simple, but very specific, that we are to follow. And you can overcome it. You've been given power to overcome it. But how many people, when they're in a conversation, where they hear something, they begin to name themselves what they have heard somebody else say? Because who told... So I know, I know some of you have said, I'm just, I'm just not worth it. Who told you that? Where'd you get that from? You did not get that from your father. I know that some of you said, ah, I'm not worth the air I breathe. I shouldn't even be alive. Who told you that? See, you're not, you're not saying the words of your Lord. No, you're echoing the words of the world, which brings me to this. Jesus gave us a principle. He said, it's not me that doeth the works, but my Father. The Father doeth the works. The Lord gave us something through his prophets. He was talking about reaping and sowing, but he gave us a principle. His word will not return void, is what he told us. Then Jesus tells us, and the apostles tell us, that we're joint heirs with Christ. This, this one gets me right here. This one gets me. You're joint heirs with Christ. Now listen up. Do you know what Jesus was and do you know what Jesus is? Because this uh, your your identity is critical. Listen, at the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. This is uh, the Gospel of John one. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. How can something be with you and be you at the same time? Ah, your Word can. Isn't that something? 
Your word can be with you and your word can be you at the same time. Isn't that awesome? And what does it say? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. The only thing that can do that, that can be that, and be with you and be you, is your word. For example, you don't know me. You know a collection of the words I've spoken. Thus, you say you know me because you heard me. You don't know me any other way by, but by what I spoke. When you're with someone, if they can speak, you don't know them any other way than by what they have spoken. Of course, they have action and things behind it, but that does not reveal who they are. You have to communicate. That reveals who they are. Isn't that awesome? So God is a thought, which is a word. That's why in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. Of course the word was with God. And the word was God. Of course the word was God. And it says the same was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. Then it says all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. What? His word. All things were made by him who the word. And without the word was not anything made that was made. In him was life. In the word was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Darkness does not comprehend the word. It confounds the word. The wise people of this earth, God says in the Old Testament, are in darkness. Let me continue. There was a man sent from, from God whose name was John. Who sent him? God did. Not the fairy tale. He did, didn't just pop up, do any of that stuff. No, God sent him. Why did God send John? Why does it not say God sent Matthew? Why does it not say God sent Peter? Why does it not say that? Because God fulfilled a prophecy when he said he was going to send someone, very important in the end of days, to turn the hearts of the children back to the Father. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Whose name was John. His name was John. And saying came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Then all men through him might believe. So he came to do what? Bear witness of the light. Who is that light? The word of God. He came to bear witness. John came to bear witness of him. For what reason? That all men through him might believe. Somebody said Elijah. There you go. That's right. Elijah. The prophecy of Elijah. That, 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 did they miss it? But don't worry. You'll see. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that light. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light. John was not that light. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Who was in the world? The word was in the world. And the world was made by him. By who? The word of God. In the beginning, God said let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. See? You see? He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. 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 Listen. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He came unto his own. Who were his own? By the line. Through flesh he came by. He's talking about who? The Jews. And they knew him not. They didn't know him. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become sons of God. We're, we're still talking about the word. So, but as many as received him, as many as received the word, to them, those that believe the word, to them, he gave power to become sons of God. You know what a son of God is? A son of God is not a son of man. A son of God is a direct creation of the living God. Thus, you have a born again spirit. Do you see it? That's what a born-again spirit is, a spirit born of God. Let's, let's continue. But as many as received him, this is John 1, 12, to them he gave power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's me. See, I didn't walk with him. I believe upon his name. That's me. Listen, even to them which believe upon his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What is that? If you're not born of blood or born of the will of flesh or born of the will of man then how are you born you are born again spiritually and what is that a direct creation of god not born by a woman not born by a, anything else a test tube or anything else but you're born by the will of god and also implies that your destiny 
was never meant to remain here, to be just some mere person. Oh, that explains it. Listen, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And it says, and we beheld his glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the word became what? Flesh. So we've been talking about the word this whole time, and now the word became flesh. But it says, John bear witness of him and cried, saying that he was of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. I think it's beautiful. So, we just talked about Christ being the Word. Now, this brings up a point now. Wait a minute. So, you saw it. You, see, you just read this yourselves. That Jesus is the Word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The world was created by him. Anything that was made was made by him. He was with God in the beginning. He is the Word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. But your joint heirs with him. Jesus is God's Word. When Jesus spoke, it was God speaking. Jesus was simply the vessel that would carry his word, or the word of the living God made flesh. But your joint heirs, whose word are you meant to carry? There it is. Whose word are you meant to carry? If your joint heirs with Christ, whose words are you meant to carry? God's words. You're not meant to carry. The words of the world. You're meant to carry your father's words. And now you know what happens inside you when you carry some other word. You felt it. Now it says God watches over his word to perform it. That's why everything Jesus stated came to be. Because God watches over his word to perform it. You're joint heirs with Christ. You're meant to carry the word of God. And when you speak your father's words he will watch over his word to perform it so what's been the problem the problem is you've not been carrying his word you've been carrying some other word all of us have and god's not watching over any foreign word to perform it he's watching over his word to perform it do you all see that that for a long time we have been trying to emulate people in this world speaking what they have written and it doesn't work out for us does it but and if you carry your father's word you have no idea of how real your father in heaven is but what element is it that gets in the way that convinces people not to carry his word or to mingle his word with something that is not his word you see what's been happening do you guys see what's been happening? Do you ladies see what's been happening? Now you know why these voices, these spirits will combat the word of God in you because they don't want you to carry your father's words. They know what will happen if you do. So they fill your mind up with an alternative word that is not your father's word. And it's been causing consequences and disappointments. See, when you speak a foreign word and you try to make it come true, it doesn't come true, does it? And it discourages you because you thought it was the Lord's word because you didn't know the connection and severity of being a vessel of God's word in this earth. So guess what happens when you begin to speak your father's word? The initials are DW. You become a direct witness of God's power and promise and his faithfulness because he will watch over his word to perform it. He will ensure that word goes out and accomplishes what it accomplishes. What you have to be careful of is simply to be careful to speak the words of the Most High, nobody else's words, because you're not meant to be ineffective in this world. Jesus gives us another hint, I'm not going to read it tonight, but he operated by a spirit. That same spirit has been poured out to you. Jesus told us, it is the Father that doeth the words. The Father is doing this. I'm speaking it, but you better believe it's the Father. That's why Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That word seen means identify, recognize. If you recognize him, you recognize the Father. Because why? Jesus is the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. That's why.
Now you know what you're meant for. Now you know with a war, why this war is escalating with you. And that's what you must overcome to keep the adversary's words out of your mouth. People are walking around powerless because the word they speak does not, it is not the Father's word. It's a hybrid word or a word from the world. Jesus taught us how to speak his word. So not only do we see here that we are meant to carry the word of the Most High, but there's something else. Jesus taught us how to speak his word. He didn't just say, listen, this is written in here. To as many as believe upon his name has he given power to become sons of God. Born again, not of blood, not of a man or a woman, not by the will of flesh, but by the will of God. That's why we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and accept unto the Lord. Because you're a holy ground. That's why Jesus said, the things I do, these things I'm doing, you're going to do them too and do greater things than these. Because you're meant to carry your father's word, not the world's word. And then he went further. He told us how to speak it. You guys remember in the, in the scriptures in the New Testament, Jesus told us, he said, you know, when you pray, he taught us how to pray, yes. But he also said something about what we should ask for. He also told us to ask for understanding because the Father gives that liberally. If the Father gives that liberally, which he does, he truly desires us to be fulfilled right now. But the big thing is, he taught us how to speak it. Remember when he said, he was talking about a double-minded man who would ask for something one minute, next minute, he'd forget or would not remember or go against it. He said, don't let that person think they're going to receive anything of the Lord. Then he said, if you ask of the Lord and you don't receive, it's because you asked amiss to consume it upon your lusts. That's what he said. So then, how do you speak your father's word? First, you go into the word and verify it's his. Right? Because if you don't, you're going to be double-minded while speaking it. You, you're going to speak his word while you're speaking it. You're going to be thinking, this ain't going to happen. But when you go back and verify that you are asking it from the right place, did you hear me? That's how he taught us to ask. You have to ask from the right place when you're not going to consume it upon your lust or... Ask the Lord for something that you desire for yourself when you don't ask for that way. That's when you boldly go to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. You ask with faith. The only way to ask with faith is to go right back to the Bible in the New Testament and learn that what you're asking is in the will of God. Why would anybody ask for anything outside of the will of God? Because once you let that thing loose, and it belongs to the Father, he's going to watch over his word to perform it, even the prayer. Then you're effective. If a dodo like me can do that from the right place within me, and results come right away for somebody else, for many other little everybody else, how much more could the power of the living God work for humanity through you? That's why Jesus said, greater things than these will you do. And he meant that. And that is real. And that is true. Because he didn't spend that much time here. Did he? But you did. That means when you ask the Lord for something, it is in line with the Lord's will. Don't convince yourself it's of the Lord's will. You get yourself in trouble. Because you'll, you'll ponder, does God really want to do this? Or am I fooling myself? But when you ask according to his will, once you know what his will actually is, Satan is going to run for real then. The devil can't do anything with you. Now you see it. How many of you see that? That you've been speaking somebody else's word when you're meant to carry your father's word. That the results are not coming because the Lord watches over his word to perform it, not anybody else's. You are joint heirs with Christ. Jesus was the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. He released the words of the father into the earth. So you have that right also. So don't be timid about it. That's why you look into the word and say, yep, that's what the Lord said right there. There it is. Be sure about the word you speak from the Father. Be careful of what comes out of your mouth. For a lot of you, you're going to have to develop different language skills so that you speak no filth or guile. Now do you see why the scriptures say no guile should come out of your mouth to be holy in all manner of communication because you're not some average person out there. Your language emulates those of the world. Cursing. All the rotten slangs, right? That emulates people of the world. You're not meant for that. You're meant to carry the Father's word. And that word, when spoken, is meant to perform. 
exactly what you release. That's what you're meant for. That's why when you're speaking somebody else's word, you have this strange feeling. It's almost like conviction. A lot of people ignore it, but it's there. How many of you have ever been talking and you just stopped? You said, I'm not supposed to be talking about this stuff. And one says, well, dreams become more spiritual when one grows closer to God. I'd say it's up to the individual. Some people don't need a dream. Some people do need a dream. It depends on the individual. But the most authentic dreams you've ever had were those prior to you becoming a real Christian. That's when you saw the real stuff. The real deal. You saw it. You can ignore it all day, but the real deal came before you fully surrendered. My personal belief is that the Lord does that to help our faith. Because if he gave you something astounding and it started to come to pass and he gave you that before you looked into the word of God, you can't sit there and say, well, maybe I had this dream because I was reading so-and-so. You can't say it. You can't say, maybe I had this dream because I heard brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Nope, because you weren't even around brother, sister so-and-so. You had that dream before you actually took some initial steps in the gospel. You had that dream before you knew the vocabulary of the gospel. You had that dream before your relationship was made solid in the gospel. You can't deny it. The Lord is so good. He is. Now it's time for us to realize, really evaluate who we're listening to. 